today we're here with Rob Pincus of ICE Training. Um, Rob, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and the start of ICE Training? Sure. I uh, appreciate you having me on the uh, show, Steve. The, um, the, the short version of the history is that in 2001, I made the decision to leave uh, full-time law enforcement work and get into the firearms industry full-time. Uh, I've been involved in the industry in, in a few different ways uh, for several years. I was a writer for SWAT magazine. I was an adjunct instructor for a couple of uh, training organizations. I was an avid student. Um, I think like my first SHOT Show was 1997. Um, so I'd been around the industry for a long time. And, and actually by 2001, it got to the point where I was spending so much time doing firearms industry related things and teaching and, and attending schools and, and media ish, uh, projects that I had to really make the decision between law enforcement work and, and the media, the uh, firearms industry, and uh, really wanting to get away from more of the media side and getting into more of the teaching. That's really where my passion was. Um, so I made the decision to do that and uh, took a couple years, took till about uh, 2003 for training and teaching to be paying all the bills, so to speak, uh, but um, did a lot of different things uh, in that interim time. It led to uh, the launching of the Valhalla Training Center, um, which some of the, the viewers, listeners may have heard of, uh, out in Colorado. So we launched that in 2003, and uh, we also launched the Combat Focus Shooting Program, which has been uh, kind of the flagship program of both Valhalla and ICE Training Company in that year. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary with that uh, intuitive defensive shooting program. We now have uh, instructors all over the country and actually all over, uh, all over the earth, really, teaching that program and um, very active in military law enforcement and in the private sector. In uh, 2007, uh, the decision was made to shut down the, the building that was the Valhalla Training Center, uh, which was attached to another project that wasn't doing as well out in Colorado. And uh, when we shut that project down, Obviously, we needed a, a name, we needed a company to continue all the training programs that we already had contracts for, and obviously, that's what I was going to continue to do, and uh, that's when I started up ICE Training Company. Um, ICE LLC had been a uh, consulting firm that I had, had started and just kind of ran on the side for special projects, and ICE stands for its, uh, Integrity, Consistency, and Efficiency, and we hold those as like the core tenets of everything that we do inside of our training programs and uh, team building, consulting, and everything we did there. So we just spun up ICE Training Company in 2008 and uh, continued with all the projects that we were working on. Um, over the last uh, 12, 13 years, more and more of my emphasis has been placed on the private sector, uh, concealed carry, home defense, um, what I would actually consider sort of the the lower end of the spectrum in terms of training. Um, if you go back, uh, my first courses were for SWAT teams and then uh, in the executive protection world, I was very active. Um, we did a lot of high-end military training in the mid-2000s. And uh, starting around 2005, 2006, we started really building our, our programs inside of the private sector for concealed carry and home defense. And uh, those programs have continued to be the emphasis for ICE training uh, over the last five or six years. So. Um, now, probably about 80% of our business is in the private sector, and a big part of that is the work I do with Personal Defense Network, uh, where we have a great relationship with the NRA, and we've produced uh, over 75 training DVDs, uh, distributed over 4 million, and uh, have about 600 million viewing minutes at our uh, online site. So we, we do a lot of work there for the private sector also. Wow. Now, are these training course at, courses at ICE offers are they do people have to travel to you or do you travel to different locales for people to participate in uh, i usually end up on about 35 or 40 different ranges or in 35 or 40 different training locations classrooms or ranges uh in any given year so i do travel uh constantly um i'm well over 300 days a year on the road um, but we still have people who, who travel to take the courses because it's, it's always you know that perfect storm of, of uh, financing availability interest um, time availability and then location plays a role. So, um, for example, I just did a course down in Florida uh, about three weeks ago where only two, we were in northern Florida, and only two of the attendees were actually from Florida. Um, it's, it's my home range, uh, Ancient City Shooting Range. My, my business is actually located just outside of Jacksonville, Florida, and I consider that one of my home ranges down there, and I teach there a lot. And uh, we don't see as many locals there because a lot of locals have taken the courses. So we see a lot of people traveling in from as far away as Wisconsin and Illinois to take courses uh, down there. So we, it's a combination. Um, we try to be as available as we can, um, but at the same time, we, we know that people come to the classes when they have the time. And, and what would you say your most popular classes that you teach are? For me personally, the most popular classes are 
uh, becoming the instructor development courses, the courses that I do, whether it's combat focus shooting instructor development, um, our defensive firearms coach program, which um, certifies people to teach a concealed carry course or a home defense class, uh, some of the uh, extreme close quarters tactics instructor development we uh, formally started doing uh, about a year ago, and my work with uh, the Association of Defensive Shooting Instructors all, all plays towards the instructor development side. Traditionally, um, overwhelmingly, the most popular course has been our two-day combat-focused shooting uh, pistol course. And, and that's really, if I had to pick you know, what my, my niche, my specialty is, um, it's certainly close quarters defensive pistol. Um, we do the rifle classes. We do shotgun classes. We do a lot of other things. But uh, the CFS program is definitely our flagship Okay, so there's a lot of train the trainer type courses that yeah, you guys really teach. Yeah, that's really what emphasis has moved to over the last couple of years. That's really interesting. What has moved you towards that? Do, do you feel that it's a it's a way that you can um, reach out and touch more people if you have more instructors with your philosophy behind them? Absolutely, and and it's it's really you know at this point it's it, it, there are definitely kernels of of my philosophy there, but but the programs that we teach now are are so heavily influenced by so many people. You know, I, I mentioned the CFS program. And the network of instructors we have, we have instructors who are military special operations guys, we have instructors who are law enforcement career 20 plus year guys, and we have guys who have never spent a day as armed professionals, uh, but who are, who are very high in the NRA structure maybe. And we have other people who come to us who've never taught uh, a day in their lives, who, who come through our instructor development process and, and start teaching, sort of team teaching and, and working with, with more experienced instructors as mentors and, and become great instructors in their own right. So we're so heavily influenced by so many diverse backgrounds that the programs we teach are a lot bigger than, uh, you know, what Rob thought was a good idea in 2003, so to speak. Right. Okay. Now you guys are just in the kind of the final stages of rolling out a new uh, reality-based training program for instructors. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, really excited about this. Um, we, We were... Approached by uh, PDT Technologies, um, the the they primarily make protective gear. Um, things like this helmet here, um, conveniently staged prop. Uh, the, uh, they they make personal protection equipment for force on force training, and they also have, have worked with ATK to design a new marking cartridge called the force on force round. And they came to me uh, with some questions about how to to get more involved in the private sector. You know, the fact is that, that reality-based training, high-level reality-based training, force-on-force training, marketage cartridge training, whatever you want to call it, simulation scenario training, has been an integral part of military and law enforcement work um, for well over a decade. Um, in fact, uh, you know, that's really where I, I first got my uh, real excitement about teaching and passion for teaching was running uh, force-on-force scenarios for, for law enforcement. And uh, in running those scenarios and really testing the application of skill as opposed to just developing skill uh, really, really got me excited about teaching and development. And I saw so many breakthroughs there. You know, we, we in the last 20 years, we've, we've benefited primarily in the, the training environment through two means, I, I think, more than any other. One is the surveillance camera video or dash camera video. So the video that we have now, the high quality video that we get from law enforcement shootings, we see from combat cameras and we see in the public sector, uh, or sorry, in the private sector from the public space cameras that are all over the place, convenience uh, stores, malls, things like that. that. They have educated us about the fact that we will not fight like we trained if the way we train has nothing to do with the, the conditions of the fight. We've seen that time and time again. Uh, you know, I, I have a standing challenge. Show me one person standing in a, in a you know a Weaver qualification course stance as a response to an ambush when they need to shoot to defend themselves. And and I've been saying that for a decade. No one's ever shown me a video. Uh, so so we know that the way you train on a range and the things that work on a range or in a competition may or may not be applicable or or available to us in a fight mode. And that has evolved training across the board. Um, the other thing has been reality based training, high level. Um, reality-based training scenarios involving uh, marking cartridges usually, well-scripted, well-run by uh, experienced instructors who really understand uh, what they're doing in there in terms of programming uh, the brain, programming responses, and involving emotional uh, components of training that you just can't get shooting at paper or shooting at steel. So uh, those two areas have influenced, I think, the training sector more than anything else in the last 20 years. And because of that, um, those are the areas that, that I try to emphasize when I'm doing instructor development. Is that If you're not paying attention to those things, you're not looking at the lessons that we learn from them, 
something's missing from your skill development training. When you are shooting a paper, you are um, fighting against, uh, you know, you're learning how to punch a bag. You're, you're fighting against someone else wearing impact gear um, or when you're, you're just shooting at steel. So the, the next evolution then for that instructor that I'm mentoring, they say, okay, go look at this stuff and learn lessons from it. Integrate that into your skill development training is to evolve to the point where you can now be part of uh, seeing your own results. Now test what you've done in terms of skill development test what you, you've educated your students about in this emotionally charged scenario environment. And quite frankly, that's cumbersome. It, it's hard to do. It's gear intensive. It's knowledge intensive. And if it's done sloppily, you can come away with some really flawed conclusions about your students' capabilities, about your own programs, and uh, develop some false confidence or, or some false uh, underconfidence, even if you, if you have students that are failing all the time uh, based on the way you're scripting scenarios. So to be able to, to influence the private sector, I think PDT, uh, the best thing they could do was come up with a training program um, for instructors. So, so it's not about how the gear looks or what the gear, you know, what, how, what your marketing package looks like or how you, you advertise in magazines or advertising TV shows. It's really about education. Um, educating the consumer and the consumer for force on force gear and, and PDT uh, personal protective equipment is the instructor. They're the ones that are going to go out and invest uh, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in this stuff, and they need to understand how to use it well. And if they understand how to use it well, they will use it well, people will be excited about it, and that sector uh, will grow inside of the private training industry. So um, the the best way I felt like I could help them and the best way they could help me was, was working together to create this reality-based training instructor development course to take the person who's already really good at skill development on the range, you can teach someone how to shoot essentially and help them uh, understand how to run good quality scenario training. Now, what things have you seen that, that have created kind of the need for standardization and certification when it comes to this reality-based training with with the marking cartridges or the non-live training ammunition? Has there been kind of a... You know, what's to say that because I, I, I teach, you know, let's say I teach a concealed handgun course and I know how to teach people to shoot at paper and maybe some scenarios. Why can't I just move right into this type of, of training for my clients? Well, there will be individuals who can. There'll be individuals who can figure it out, who can, can you know, kind of reverse engineer things they've been through and, and be able to pull it off. But the reality is it's no different than than teaching that basic shooting skill. We we. The industry as a whole would not suggest that it's a good idea for uh, someone to go to a, a shooting class or two and then go back to their hometown, stand in front of a big hill of dirt and put up a sign that says firearms instruction based solely on having gone to a couple courses um, and then trying to kind of reverse engineer what the instructors were doing. You know, there's there's a process. There's whether it's the NRA's instructor development process, uh, ICE training companies instructor development process a law enforcement or military environment. There are processes, well-established processes for helping people learn how to run a range safely, how to teach responsibly, how to communicate well, how to uh, educate adults and, and how to develop physical skills. These, these sciences, these, this research area is very, very well developed. And, and I would say that the, the, the work of, of people like Ken Murray um, with his training at the speed of life uh, concept and his uh, formation of the Reality Based Training Association, Ken Murray, um, going all the way back to being one of the founders of the Simunitions Company uh, over the last 20 years, has, has been a great example of how there is a formal process and there are things that, that an instructor needs to know about scenario training and there are very effective ways to teach that. Um, however, that's only been really something that's been done in law enforcement in the military sector. So when you look at the private sector as a whole, there, there has been no formal education for instructors in the private sector in how to run high-level scenario training. One of the reasons for that is that the gear really hasn't been available. Um, largely, the companies that manufacture the marking cartridges and the conversion kits and the, the protective equipment have only targeted and in some cases only allowed law enforcement or military to purchase their equipment. And only in the last year has that really started to change overwhelmingly across the industry. Well, now that the gear is more available, I feel very strongly that we need to make the, the concepts and the training uh, for the instructors, the instructor development side, more available as well. Because the, the fear is that just like you could see someone teaching a very sloppy gun handling class uh, when they, they've only been a student and not really been taught how to teach, we're, we're already seeing, uh, quite frankly, whether it's airsoft or, or marking cartridges, we're already seeing some sloppy 
uh, force on force training. Uh, force on force training is a lot more than just the gear. And, and unfortunately, there's too many instructors and I think way too many potential students in the private sector who think if you're using marking cartridges, it must be awesome. If you're using airsoft, it must be realistic. And, and that's simply not true. There's a lot more to the scripting and to the organization of a reality training se- session, reality-based training session, uh, than just having the right equipment. Right. And what's more, too, I think, is there's a lot of, not that there's not significant safety implications of just regular firearms training, but ideally everyone is pointed in the same direction. But when you're talking about reality-based training with, with marking cartridges, you're shooting guns at people. Yeah. And I think uh, safety is probably a pretty uh, big part of what you guys, I'm guessing, is of what you guys teach in the course as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a 30-hour program, and I, and I would say a solid five or six hours is really devoted to safety issues and safety aspects of, of running those programs. Um, first, first, environmental control. You know, um, there's, if there's one thing that I cannot stress enough for instructors in these environments is that you have got to be dogmatic. Uh, about safety and about the exclusion of any live ammunition or, or knives or anything that could be used as an actual tool to hurt someone in that environment. I mean, just within the last year, we had an instructor in a law enforcement environment, and unfortunately, this this is not an uncommon story. It happens a couple times a year. We had an instructor who was wearing a live gun and a marking gun in a scenario environment who was essentially just messing around, being an ass clown, thought he was going to shoot one of the students in the side of the head to make a point um, with a marking cartridge. He drew the wrong gun and shot one of his own students in the head with a live gun. Uh, universally, universally, anyone running these, this type of training would tell you that, that he was horrifyingly wrong to bring a live gun in there. And I've heard every excuse in the world, well, we need to be able to protect ourselves. Or what if someone comes into our training environment? It's all horseshit, <laughs> honestly. I don't know if you have to edit that out. But the safety of the students comes first. If you really, if you're training an environment where you're that worried about it, post a guard and post them outside of your cleared perimeter uh, for for the the safe area for training. Um, so there's simple things like that that are obvious, and then there's more subtle things um, like uh, the, the importance of throat protection and why how to wear throat protection properly in the training environment, and and quite honestly, how to script your scenarios so that. You, you won't have physical confrontations that the personal protection equipment isn't designed to uh, protect from. So in other words, you don't want people going hands-on uh, at, at a very low level of physical skill. If they don't know how to train, if they're not martial artists, if they're not grapplers, you don't want people going hand-to-hand um, with, with heavy metal guns in their hands and, and gear that is not designed to protect from impact. And most of the force-on-force training gear is not designed to protect from in, impact. So one of the things we're sharing with people from a safety standpoint is how to script scenarios well and train your role players well so that those things don't happen. Um, the, the, the dangers that exist are, are really obvious when you've been doing it for 15 years. But when someone buys their first set of protective equipment and their first couple sets of uh, non-lethal training firearms and they, they put those students into an environment to train, they may not see those things coming. And the fact is our, our instructor cadre has, has been doing this for a decade or more uh, in almost every case, the five leaders in, in this program. So we've seen a lot of the pitfalls. We've made a lot of the mistakes, quite honestly. And, and that's one big thing that this program is about is here's the mistakes we've made. Here's the pitfalls that, that we will tell you are coming. Uh, and here's how to avoid it. I'm fortunate enough that I participate in this reality-based training at, at least once a quarter um, with my agency and what I do for a living. And I know it, even just starting out um, 10 years ago, uh, I guess closer to 12 years now, when I first got into law enforcement, it was... Um, unbelievable how, um, I guess I could say, stringent they were about checking each other for ammo, for live ammo, even just the rounds in addition to firearms. So I know that's a huge portion of it, and, and I'm glad to see that you guys uh, cover that in there because you hear about it, like you said, a couple times a year. They go to, and it usually always happens after lunch. Everybody puts their guns on after lunch. Uh, you know, they come back, and uh, somebody forgets to download all their equipment, and something really bad happens during the training. So it's it's, it's hard to in the military and law enforcement environment. We see a lot of social aspects, uh, just that, that peer engagement and peer peer operated training is is difficult to police sometimes. So people get sloppy people get complacent and uh, the one incident that that i was uh involved in the training uh, block that i was overseeing we had uh, a military group in and it were about six training stations and we had a very high-ranking individual 
uh, come through a live fire training session, go over to another range that was being run uh, by the military peer instructors, and that was a, a marking cartridge range, and they had him switch rifles, but they did not pat him down. They didn't check him. They didn't clear his pistol, and he ended up uh, on a transition from a failure when his uh, sim rifle went down. He went to his pistol, and luckily no one was hurt, and it was in a, a controlled environment, safe environment for live fire anyway, but he fired a round out of a live pistol in a marking cartridge environment. Um, they were doing CQB work against uh, targets, not against each other, luckily, but um, but that was strictly a peer issue. So nobody wanted to tell that high-ranking individual that, that he had to go through the same process as everyone else. So some of the social aspects of, of controlling people in, in a way that, that ensures safety but also doesn't offend um, is also part of the part of the instructor development course. Right. Yeah, I think ego plays a large role in that. You know, um, I'm an experienced operator. I know what I'm yeah. doing. I don't need anyone to pat me down. I know I've seen that happen before, too. So oh, we put up a video at Personal Defense Network last year with uh, Gander Mountain Academy on this very topic. Um, we had done uh, a couple of DVDs with uh, Ken Murray for PDN on scenario based training. And some of that information will actually be presented as part of this reality based uh, training instructor development course. But one of the videos we put up publicly was about a safety pat down prior to engaging in any kind of scenario training. And, uh, you know, the typical comments on the Internet, all the bravado and all the ego and all the no one's patting me down and I'm not giving my gun up just so I can train. You know, I mean, just the infantile responses were uh, were unfortunately you know, somewhat predictable. Uh, and, and, the, and, you know, the answer is real simple. Great. Then you're not going to participate in this training. You know, here's your money back. Have a good day. Right. Yeah, there's definitely a simple answer to that one, you know. Okay, we talked about safety. We've talked about um, some of the scenario development that you go through with these candidates. What other things do you guys cover um, to fill that 30 hours and make sure that the instructors that go through this course um, and they're up for certification, what else do you go through with them? Well, there's there's a little bit of, of history and development of of role player uh, involved training and, and what I consider the importance of the emotional uh, component of that. And we talk a lot about the, the neuroscience, the psychology of the training and, and what we're really testing. Um, you know, that's an important part to focus on. So after we get through sort of the history and development, we talk about what I think is the major evolution and shift uh, in scenario training, which is from skill based training to application of skill training, which is so important, I think, to understand. You're not training marksmanship in the middle of a home invasion scenario. Train your marksmanship on the range with a real gun. Uh, in the middle of the home invasion scenario, you're, tr you're testing and, and developing the application of skill. And th we know that the, the, any of the non-lethal training ammunition isn't 100%, right? Whether it's, it's uh, the airsoft or the force on force from ATK or the sim munitions or the UTM, it's not 100% one-to-one simulation of your real gun. So when you want to train your shooting skills, go use your real gun. When you're training to apply those skills, when you're training to draw under stress, when you're training to recognize pre-contact cues, when you're training to decide when to evacuate, when to de-escalate, uh, when, to, when to fight, when to draw your gun and shoot, all of those decision-making processes, that's really what we're focusing on. And then we go into the next block, the, the most important block, I think, to understand, and, and one of the hardest uh, hurdles to overcome to run high-quality scenario training is having good role players. Um, you know, I, I've run uh, our Extreme Close Quarters Counter Ambush uh, courses uh, scores of times for, for the highest level uh, individuals inside of our military. Uh, been on contract with, with Navy components and Army components and, and run these courses time and time and time again, and the only thing that I think makes that training stand out. And the thing that really makes it incredibly valuable is the quality of the role players that I've had working for me and with me uh, and the in-role coaching that happens where we actually have instructors involved in these force-on-force -force engagements uh, with sim guns and with impact reduction suits. So we're, we're doing hands-on and we're doing verbal and we're doing awareness and we're doing escape and we're doing de-escalation and there's shooting involved. And in those programs, there's so many moving pieces that if your role players sort of go rogue on you, if the, if the role player turns it into a competition, if the role player you know, just goes off script, all of a sudden everything starts falling apart and the student isn't going to get the experience that the instructor in charge wants them to have and needs them to have for the, for the training objectives to be met. On the other hand, if your role players are well controlled and are well scripted and are disciplined and if they, they're part of the training objective, they understand sometimes it's their job to fall down, period. Sometimes it's your job to stay up. 
period. You know, what's the emotion we're trying to elicit? What's the end game of, of skill application we're trying to get the student to? Uh, that's incredibly important. So, so we really talk a lot about role player development and uh, the idea that, you, that student on student, um, force on force, really ha has almost no place in the high level reality based training realm. Um, you can do a lot of good things with student on student drills and student on stu student reps and student on student skill development. But when it really comes time to test the application of skill, um, you need to get the student out of the, the equation and, and put the, the person that you're evaluating and the person whose skill that you're trying to develop and response patterns you're trying to program in that scenario with role players who are going to give them the right pre-contact cues and the right amount of energy to challenge them and to steer them in a direction the scenario is designed to go. So we really emphasize that. And, and that'll be a big hurdle for a lot of instructors is, well, how do I get role players? Who are my role players going to be? Do I have to pay them? Do, who Can they be former students? You know, all that kind of stuff. And there's, I, that's, if there's a weak link in the program, it's that, you know, it's, it's that six months after we certify somebody, I'm going to see a video online where somebody's using students and, and they're going to have every valid in their brain reason for doing it. Oh, I, my guy was sick. My guy didn't show up. Uh, I couldn't find anybody. It was too expensive. I only had two students, so I couldn't afford to hire a role player. So I let them go against each other. All of those excuses undermine the legitimacy of the training. Um, so, so scripting role players and role player development is a huge part of this program. Um, uh, some of the then obviously we go over all the gear, all the variations in the gear. Um, now we're partnered up with PDT, so we'll, we'll be using their personal protection equipment. We'll be using the force on force round from ATK. Um, but but these these principles apply across the board. And and again, whether you're using a, a you know a rubber band wrapped around your finger to to, to be the gun. Uh, or you're using the, the best force-on-force force, uh, rounds out there with the, the simunitions kit or whatever it is you're using, really doesn't change the all everything but the shooting. Up to the moment of the shooting, all the decision-making, all the emotion, all the pre-contact cue recognition, all the positioning, all the dealing with bystanders, uh, and then the aftermath of the shooting uh, for concealed carry guys getting on the phone, uh, maybe medical response uh, inside of your home, securing your family, dealing with the police showing up at your house. All of those things are also somewhat irrelevant of which non-lethal training ammunition you're using. So the, the gear that we go over will be very specific to the concept and the principle and how we deal with gear as just being a tool and part of the process um, will be a big part of the, the instructor development program. And one of the cool things is anyone who does get certified uh, will have the opportunity to purchase a, sort of a starter kit from PDT. So they'll get about, uh, it's somewhere north of $1,500, approaching $2,000 worth of gear for $1,200 if they successfully complete the course, which is kind of cool. Wow, yeah, I know some of that gear can get can get pretty expensive um, based on, because I know it provides a high level of protection too now. Um, what? How do you guys prepare instructors to deal with the fine line of training between um, training civilians and training law enforcement with that fine line being de-escalation versus further engagement? How do you guys train them to, to handle that? It's, it's a big, big part of it. Um, with the uh, Ken Murray describes uh, all the scenarios as having a, a series of potential outcomes. And, and he talks about uh, you could run. Um, you can talk, you can fight, or you can shoot. We're taking fight out of the equation. Um, because of the nature of this program, it's, it's a 30-hour program. These are going to be uh, what I would consider very you know, fundamental level coaches in terms of uh, scenario training. And these are going to be you know, hopefully guys from all, all spectrums, but we're really like the core, the, the prototype of our student is the NRA certified instructor who teaches a state-approved concealed carry course um, who teaches somewhere between you know 25 and 30 students uh, a month or you know 50 students a quarter and now wants to take his training to the next level and offer something better and 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 more specific to his graduates to his students uh, so at that level uh, we we don't know if this person has any concept of unarmed training or, or you know, martial arts skills or grappling skills or any of that so we're just leaving that off the table so we're gonna we're gonna script our scenarios and build this program around just simply the talk, uh, run, or shoot scenario. So we're taking the physical component out, the hand-to-hand -hand component out. Okay. And, and the, the talk and run uh, will absolutely be the right answers in some of the scenarios. As, as part of this pro program, uh, they'll, they'll leave the course with a series of scripted scenarios designed to be incredibly time efficient, 
um, relatively easy to script with the role players and uh, designed to teach specific points to their students. Obviously, I don't want to go too far into what those will be and, and ruin it for any potential students that are watching this uh, or listening to us right now. But um, they're, they'll leave with, with some really nice templates and some really nice scripted scenarios that they can use. Inside of those scenarios, shoot is not always the answer. Um, one of my biggest frustrations going back into the 90s was um, the fact that like 99.9% .9 of the SWAT CQB type training that, that I had ever seen or when I got on a SWAT team and participated in, uh, you know, involved running through a, an area looking for a target and then, you know, bang, bang, whether it was finger gun, bang, bang, or sim gun, bang, bang, or a uh, live fire into a bullet trap, bang, bang, and then, you know, let's reset and do it again. But on the other hand, 99.9% .9 of actual SWAT operations involve wrestling with people and pushing people out of the way and getting other family members out and pushing people down and handcuffing people. And you're wearing all this gear and like that wasn't being trained. So uh, I had an opportunity uh, as a part of an, as an adjunct team for an instructor group running some SWAT training down in Florida to really push the envelope of integrating unarmed training and the sim, sim rounds, the, the non-lethal training ammunition type training. And really, it was amazingly eye-opening and just kind of changed everything for me in terms of my approach to how to do scenario-based training well and really scripting the scenarios to what actually happens. And that sort of epiphany, why are, just because we have these things and we're using them doesn't mean it's reality-based. We need to go back to those videos, go back to our experience of what's actually happening and train around that. That's what makes it reality-based. Then when you add the tools in, it just becomes that much more powerful. And it was actually um, at, at one of those training uh, scenarios, one of those training iterations, that uh, one of the, the attending agencies had uh, something called a high gear suit, um, an impact reduction suit designed by Tony Blauer um, that he uses in, in his unarmed training, his spear training, and then evolved into using in arm training as well uh, with the marking cartridges. And uh, using that suit took it to a whole nother level because it was it was a great suit. You could move in it. You you were protected from big impacts, but you weren't um, you know immobilized like like mattress and duct tape you know <laughs> kind of suits you couldn't move in. So uh, that put me in contact with him. And then through the early two thousands, I, I was a student of the Spear program and a student in some of the instructor development programs that that Tony ran. And he ran a great. Uh, program for developing reality-based training scenarios also and really stress the role player aspect as well. So um, he, he and I did a lot of great work together and I learned a lot from him during that time and uh, it heavily influenced a lot of the things that I've done in the last decade. So going, going all the way back to just sort of winging it and trying to figure out what was going on to uh, studying under Tony and studying under Ken Murray and then all of the, the hands-on sort of on-the-job training, the, the military uh, scenario training programs that I was running for, for years and years and years, uh, influences and, and uh, informs all the information that's inside of this program. And, and one of those, those, the biggest aspects is how to deal with the decision-making process. That's really what it's about. And, and whether it was a military guy or a law enforcement guy or a civilian guy, that decision-making process, do I draw my gun? Do I shoot this guy? Do I escape? Do I evacuate? Do I try to de-escalate? Um, is a question that, that exists across the board. And you know, to your point, originally, there is a difference between law enforcement job and the, the civilian personal defense job. And it, the, I always say that if you have the flashy red and blue lights and the shiny badge, you have to go towards the bang bang sounds. That's your job. If you're not in that in that role, you don't you you go away from the bang bang sounds. One of the interesting things about it, though, is that I think we spend a lot of time in in fire defensive firearms training classes talking about what you know how to avoid needing to use the gun. I really see that as a as a separate course. That's a separate thing. Uh, in, in, if you come to a combat focused shooting class, we say that class starts at the moment you realize you need to shoot. We don't spend all, any time talking about de-escalation. We don't talk about avoidance. We don't talk about awareness. Those are all incredibly important things. But this is a counter ambush shooting program. We have two days. We have to develop physical skills. We're going to work on what happens when you need to shoot. When you get to a scenario training program, you can't do that. We, we, we aren't there to test just shooting skill. So, so we really do have to go five or six or eight or 10 steps backwards. And again, I, I'll emphasize, this is where the role player development comes in handy. Because if you don't have good role player development, if you literally just have a student that, that showed up at the same time as the other student, you have no idea what their background is. You have no idea what their mindset is. And you say, okay, do A, B, and C, and let's see how he responds. You're, you're 
you know, you're, you're throwing darts in the air and hoping you don't get hit on top of the head and, and it lands on a bullseye somewhere. It, it's just, it's, it's a low uh, return on investment kind of training. Um, so, so really investing time in the role players, that's how we get the decision making process there. We'll tell the role players, we, for example, um, years ago at uh, Bahala, we had a home invasion scenario where it was a guy who comes to the house who's drunk or on drugs or just out of it, mentally you know, deranged, but offers no threat whatsoever. Kicks the door in. You know, we had a, a great 360-degree training area. So kicks the door in and rants and raves and maybe kicks the TV or knocks over a chair. But the role player was strictly scripted to stay away from the student. So the student was two or three rooms away down a hall in the bedroom. And the, and the test was, stay, do you stay in the bedroom and call the police and barricade your door with your gun in your hand? Or do you run in the living room and shoot the guy because he's making a ruckus? You know, um, And we'd change a scenario where if the person had a family, we'd tell them, well, your family's in this room. Okay, so now there is something to do. Don't just stay in your bedroom. Secure your family. Protect your family. Even if you feel compelled to go out and investigate, once you see that there's a person in your house, do you stop at the last corner and, and challenge the person verbally? Or once again, do you rush in or do you just start shooting? So in my mind, the answer in that scenario was run if you didn't have to worry about defending family members, in other words, barricade, or talk, de-escalate, get the guy to leave. But there was never an, an appropriate shooting solution in that scenario. I don't care, castle doctrine, whatever. There was never a moral and ethical need to shoot. There was never the all of the components of, of danger presented to the student. So that was a great way to see that decision-making process you're talking about, whereas law enforcement in that environment would be compelled to move forward, not to shoot the guy, but certainly compelled to move forward and control the guy and get the guy in the handcuffs. Right. So there is definitely a difference, you know, and in a military environment, well, the, the scenario may not even be applicable, right? But if you're, if you're trying to clear a house and there's one guy ranting and raving and you're looking for a high value uh, asset that, that isn't that guy, sort of the discipline to, to do what you need to do to get past that distraction, and carry on with the mission uh, might be something we are trying to, to elicit in that kind of a scenario. You talked a little bit about scenarios and, and trying to stay general for the future students that might be listening. What are some scenarios they can expect to um, be equipped with when they get back to teach others about? Well, the scenarios that we're going to give the instructor uh, candidates, uh, one will be a vehicle based scenario. One will be a public environment scenario, concealed carry. Uh, one will be a home scenario, home invasion type scenario. Uh, and then there'll be two that I'll, I'll, I'll sort of hold back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That... But, but those are, you know, that's the idea is to, to hit the, the, you know, definitely hit the vehicle, definitely hit the public environment, definitely hit the home environment. And then, uh, have a couple of others that'll be probably more of a surprise. And, and based on a concept we have called the plausibility principle, you know, what is it, what is reasonable to train for? What are the plausible Things we can't train for everything that's that's possible, right? right? Um, we have to train for the most probable things, and those are the three most probable ones: that you're you're out in a public space, in a store, or a restaurant, uh, that you're in your vehicle or around your vehicle, or you're inside of your home. You know, we can we can say that about virtually everyone in the public space, right? If if you're on that, you know, uh, life life below zero show, I guess we don't have to worry about the public space. <laughs> the others are everybody else. Uh, the public space and the vehicle and, and the home, those are the three scenarios um, that everyone will have to deal with, you know, throughout a common day, typical day. So we'll have those in there and, and then a couple others. Similar to students coming in to be taught by the instructors that you're going to, to teach in this class, um, you would, I would imagine you're going to get applicants and instructors of all levels to want to attend your class. Are there any prerequisites that you require before somebody can even sign up for your course? The only prerequisite is that you must be a certified instructor um, under some organization. And, and that can be a public sector organization. You know, you've graduated from a law enforcement instructor uh, program or military, or it can be private sector like the NRA um, or even uh, uh, another private sector company that's smaller, uh, IC training company. Uh, you know, there are, there are other companies out there that offer instructor development. Uh, Range Master does, uh, Firearms Academy of Seattle does. Uh, they're, they're Plenty of them out there, and and certainly if someone were an instructor with a, an established company, you know, some of this is subjective. If if somebody says, "Well, I'm an instructor," look at my website, and you know, they they've taught one class, and they you know have the kind of the dirt berm, and their their training resume is is one class deep, and they just kind of hung a shingle up. That we're probably going to suggest they go out and take the NRA basic pistol course or some other type of uh, beginner instructor level course. 
if someone is uh, an adjunct instructor for for a well established company and has been for years, I'm not going to ask them, you know, when they graduated from the NRA course. Um, they'll be more than welcome. So uh, the, the prerequisite is that you're already a firearms instructor. In other words, we don't want people coming into this program that that don't understand how to run a range, don't understand how to develop firearms uh, skill in other people, don't already have some concepts of firearms handling, safety, and how to get. Uh, a group of people to interact with the tools safely in the training environment. So we really are, that that's the the target audience. Um, and of the thirty hours, uh, about two thirds of them are distance education. So we're we're putting the final touches right now on the online uh, the distance learning portion. So we've got video as well as uh, handouts, uh, online tests and quizzes to prepare for the live class. And the live class will be a ten to twelve hour day, depending on the size of the class. And uh, we're going to run one of them a month. Uh, the first one is going to be in uh, Las Vegas, just uh, right after SHOT Show uh, in January. And then uh, we're doing one in February in Ohio. And we're doing one in March in Florida. And then uh, we'll continue to space them around the country uh, during the other months of the year. So we're going to run 12 courses in 2014. Naturally, uh, like any other program, we're going to learn a lot about the program and how to teach it. Uh, by teaching it. Um, you, you, anybody who thinks they can predict how that's going to go um, probably hasn't launched a new training program. Right, exactly. Um, so, so we know that we're, we're in for a learning curve ourselves. Um, and, and I'm joined by some very, uh, very experienced guys, both uh, as students and instructors when it comes to force on force and scenario development. Um, Omari Broussard at 10X Defense, Alessandro Padovane at Safer Faster Defense, um, Derek Poole at Echo 5 Training Group and uh, Barrett Kendrick at Bearco Training down in Louisiana. Um, that, that's a core of our instructor team. And, and I have no doubt that we'll add some names to, to that leadership by the end of the year as well. Is there going to be a source, a central source of information that I can go to if I want to participate in this as a student, N not the instructor development class, but if I'm a you know, if I carry a concealed weapon and I want, I think, you know, it's time to add reality-based training to my regimen. Is there one place I can go to find out in my area or in the general area around me where somebody's, where I can find someone that's been through your course that's certified to teach this right? We'll have, we'll have a list of people at the icetraining.us website. Um, PDT will also be maintaining a list of people who've graduated because obviously they're going to be using their equipment. Um, they will have participated in uh, that, that starter kit package and, and maybe more gear uh, from them. So PDT will also be offering a list of uh, certified and credentialed uh, training companies and individuals who are going to be using the equipment. Uh, it, it depends on how, honestly, I'll tell you that it depends on how big the program gets. Um, if we have, if we max out, you know, we're, we're saying we're going to max out at 24 students per. Um, if we max out the first few classes, then yeah, we'll probably throw a website up um, just for graduates of the reality-based training instructor development course and maybe a Facebook page and we'll, we'll help those instructors spread the word about when they're offering classes. Um, the, the faster these programs grow and the bigger they get, then the more support they get, you know, like anything else. Uh, the, the, there's only so much bandwidth to go around. So the bigger the project, um, and I'm very excited about this one, I hope it becomes a big project. Um, the bigger the project is, then the more attention you'll get and the easier it will be to find. Um, a, a parallel would be the, the school attacker response course that we, we started up uh, actually just about a year ago um, after the Sandy Hook incident last year. I had several people asking uh, for what IC training company's response you know, is to how do we prepare teachers, how do we prepare students, what do we do? So we, we spun up a, a one-day instructor development course uh, for a, a two- to four-hour seminar that could be taught to students or, or teachers or faculty or staff. And we ran several of those instructor development courses around the country over the last year. And we started up a website and listed all the instructors that wanted to be listed there um, as a resource for people looking for uh, people to present to teachers or come into schools and do seminars. So um, that's an example of a project that we launched that, that was very successful very quickly. And it did get that kind of support. And I imagine this one will as well. For all the instructors out there that... that want to add this to their offerings for their students, where can they go? Um, should they go to your icetraining.us website to find out when there's going to be a class in their area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, or icestore.us. Either way, um, when they look at the training calendar, they look at the course offering uh, for reality-based training instructor course, um, they'll see what's being offered. Uh, the, the online distance education pro uh, part of the process will be available by the end of the year. And then the first live course, again, is uh, about the third weekend, third or fourth weekend in January out in Las Vegas. And the way it's going to work is, is uh, 
pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You must complete the distance education portion prior to attending a live class. Um, the course is, is $299, and uh, we're going to have a discount for Association of Defensive Shooting Instructor members, um, so there will be communications through ADSI for them. Um, the reason we're doing that, normally my instructor development courses are $250 to $300 per day, and they're three to five days. Uh, the reason we're doing this one at, at such a reduced rate is because of the, the, the uh, support from PDT. The project started with uh, personal defense technologies. Uh, went with, with them coming to us and saying that, that they wanted uh, to partner with us and that they were only going to release this package to people that we certified after the, the early conversations and they understood you know, what we could bring to the table, um, they also are now helping us promote it. They're helping us share the opportunity with different people. And, and quite frankly, the package that they're offering is, is so valuable um, that that's going to entice a lot of people to take the program also. Um, with any new program, you know, it's, it's untested. So people are going to be sort of taking a little bit of a leap of faith. I mean, I think we have a really good track record, not only for program development, but also for instructor development. Um, but there'll be people who've never trained with us before who may be skeptical. Um, but at that $299 uh, intro price uh, to take 30 hours worth of instructor development training uh, from, from some of the leaders in the industry, uh, hopefully that will, will push people over that hurdle of uh, skepticism and get them to the course. For those who would have showed up anyway, uh, well, they're getting a bargain, um, which is which is cool. So we're launching the program. Uh, it's very affordable. You sign up, you know, tell us your instructor, show us your credentials, tell us where you teach or kind of what your background is. Cool, you're approved. You go online. Um, you do the distance education. When you come to the live uh, training day, obviously it's going to be a very busy day. Um, we're going to run all of those candidates through the scenario so they can experience it and understand what the end goal is. We're going to uh, show them again all the safety procedures we expect them to run. We're going to get them to teach. Um, they'll do some demo teaching. They'll do some some demo uh, operations of an environment. Um, we'll talk to them about scripting and role player development. Um, we'll have some people there for them to actually run through scenarios, so they'll get to do some some actual uh, operations uh, in the, in the role that they're they're trying to attain. And then there'll be a written test. So um, not only will they have to successfully complete all the subjective uh, teaching moments, but they're also going to have to then take a written test and get a 90% or above in order to get certified uh, in the program. If they do not pass the written test, there will be op opportunities for retesting in the future. Um, if they don't pass the subjective portion of the class, then they'll, they'll be invited to, to get themselves to another course and attend another uh, live day somewhere later in the year some, at some other location. Um, there won't be any additional costs and once people pay their, their tuition, um, as, and I do this with all my instructor development programs, once you pay your tuition, you're covered, uh, come back and take the course as many times as it takes or study as long as you need, retest as, as much as you need to. Um, we have time frames built in and we have some other controls in it um, to, to make sure people don't test every day just hoping to get lucky. Um, we usually have a 30-day waiting period between tests, things like that. But um, you know, we want people to be successful. And, and I realize not everybody's going to be successful their first time out of the gate. Um, we're certainly not going to certify everyone, um, but, but we expect that we're going to have a very high success rate. We've covered a lot today, and I just want to I want to move backwards just really quickly to um, just training in general. And I think anyone that's listened to me on the network before knows I'm I'm pretty passionate about training. I'm one of those guys that if any training comes through at work, you can guarantee that I'm going to volunteer for it. Um, what's your philosophy on training and its importance in preparing people for what to expect in life? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I can't. I mean, I, this is what I do, right? So this is this is where my passion is, and this is what what I'm all about is teaching and learning uh, is a huge part of that. You know, um, I want to learn as much as I can I, I, through travel, through attending classes, reading, distance education, podcasts, documentaries, you know, reading books, whatever you name it. I'm I'm constantly trying to just experience new things and, and learn new stuff. And whether it's formal, attending a class or, or an informal just experience, um, like a scenario is, is really experiential training, then uh, that's what I'm passionate about. So I try to, to help others, you know, find that passion in themselves, you know, and if it's, if it's self-defense that they're excited about, if it's protecting their family that they're excited about, if they're an armed professional, it's, it's their career that they're excited about, whatever it is, I want to help facilitate that learning process. I, I think it's incredibly important. Um, and, I, and I'm pretty, pretty blunt with people, you know, whether it's on the Internet or some of the like I'll, I'll speak at the NRA convention again uh, this year. And last year when I spoke, you know, I had 500 people in a room and, and I'll have a mom raise their hands. You know, who has more than five guns at home in the safe? You know, and almost all the hands go up. You know, OK, keep your hands up. And, and those of you who have more than five guns, put your hand down 
if you've never taken a form, you know, I said, sorry, put your hand down if the primary bottom line reason that you own firearms is not personal defense or home defense in a worst case scenario. And you'll see some of the hands go down, but almost everybody, I, I think in America, you know, 90% plus of your firearms owner will tell you that their bottom line reason, uh, the gun they'll get rid of last is, is that defensive gun. It's not the hunting gun or the competition gun. So cool. So now I got, you know, 200, 300 hands in the air. How many of you don't have a formal defensive training certificate? How many of you have never attended a formal defensive class? And a lot of hands, you know, will go down. Um, what I'll tell them is go sell a gun. Horrifying. What do you mean sell a gun? <laughs> if you have more than five guns in your safe and you say to yourself and your family and your neighbors and your friends and people on the internet and your forum or wherever you are that you're primarily a gun owner for personal defense or, you know, worst case scenario, defense of our country, and you have more than six guns in the safe, go sell one and take a course. And if you don't need to sell one to take the course, good, just go take the course and have 12 guns, have 20 guns, have 80 guns. I'm a gun collector. I am a gun enthusiast. And, I, and I, there's nothing wrong with being a gun collector and a gun enthusiast. But if you're just a gun collector and you're telling people, including yourself, that you're, you own guns for personal defense, but you're not actually training, you're lying to yourself. Um, you're, you're just a gun collector. So either own that or own less guns and get more training or you know find the money to go take the training. I, I think it's so incredibly important. And, you know, when it comes to personal defense, I'm really adamant that your military service is has nothing to do with protecting your family in the mall. Your law enforcement career may have nothing to do with carrying a concealed firearm and, and defending somebody in a public space. So get, uh, you know, specific task specific training. If just because you're you're a military combat, that doesn't mean that you have the skills that, that you need to pull that Glock 19 out at the mall. You know, the the, the military combat that may never have touched a handgun in many cases. So it's a very different thing. Um, so I, I'm pretty adamant that training and task-specific training is, is part of your responsibility as a firearms owner. Um, being honest with yourself is part of your responsibility as a firearms owner. And uh, if you're not meeting that training uh, requirement and then, and then continuing on with a practice, with a skill maintenance requirement, um, you're, you're just not fulfilling that responsibility. Yeah, but I, I teach courses here and there. And one thing I often tell my students is that um, under times of extreme stress, you just, you, you, for lack of better terms, you get dumb and you revert back to the basics of what you've trained and, and you can't expect to magically rise to the occasion if you've never trained to rise to that occasion before. So, um, I, I couldn't agree with you more on all your points there regarding training, Rob. Yeah, cool. I, I tell people, you know, your best you should expect is your worst rep in training. So until your worst rep is acceptable, go practice. Right, exactly. Uh, we've talked about a lot today, Rob. Is there anything else uh, you want to cover before we uh, before we move on with the show? Anything we haven't discussed that you want to talk about? No, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share the news about the reality-based training instructor course, uh, our partnership with PDT, and uh, kind of my passion for instructor development and teaching and, and good high-quality scenario training. Um, as far as resources, I would just point people uh, that, that – if you aren't interested in coming out and taking the course right away or, or you want to learn more about you know my approach or kind of the philosophy that, that's going to be uh, represented in these programs that we've talked about is go over to Personal Defense Network. Uh, PersonalDefenseNetwork.com has you know, scores of free videos and dozens and dozens of articles um, by a lot of other people, not just me. Um, but it, it, there's, a, there's kind of a common thread about practical training. Uh, we cover every aspect from unarmed to armed to home defense to even, even fitness and the role that fitness plays in your personal defense preparation. Uh, and it's all free. Um, there are some premium memberships available. There's, there's DVDs you can buy. But there's a lot of free information at personaldefensenetwork.com, and it's a great place to get started. Well, thanks for your time, Rob. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate you having me on the show.